Good morning and welcome to the Old First Church here in Bennington, Vermont. Welcome to all of you who are with us at worship live today and also to those who are listening on our live stream. I invite you all to join us now in an hour of worship. We will begin by saying the opening words which are found in the order of service. And again, in this time, we are not standing for hymns but we are standing for the uh, Gloria Patri and the Offertory, uh, but otherwise um, we'll be seated and uh, you can speak the word softly, uh, but we won't be singing ourselves. We'll be listening to Jean Marie Callahan sing the hymns, and you certainly can speak words to those hymns as well as she sings along. Join me, if you will, in the opening words. Let us be joyful in the works of God. God shall guide us on the path we walk. Our first hymn is For the Beauty of the Earth. Our opening prayer is found in the order of service. You may join me in reading it responsively, or reading it in unison. Break through our darkness and fears, Lord. Let the light of your salvation and hope shine on us, in us, and through us, that healing and hope may abound in your world. We remember always that God speaks to us through the beauty of this creation, and so may we respond in lives of goodness. Help us to see with your grace and turn to your word of hope in this world. May our lives be ever changed by the miracles of this new season. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray, amen. The Lord is merciful and gracious, 
slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. If we confess our faults, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. First lesson today is taken from the letter of John, the first letter of John, chapter 3, verses 16 through 24. We know love by this, that Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need? and yet refuses help. Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and God knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey God's commandments and do what pleases God. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit he has given us. Here ends the first lesson. Our hymn is The Lord's My Shepherd. The second lesson is from the Gospel of John. It's in the 10th chapter, verses 11 through 18. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. 
The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. I lay down my, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Here ends the second lesson. Once again, it's Good Shepherd Sunday. It comes every spring just as sure as the lambs uh, enter into the green pastures. It seems we have this. This is part of the uh, post-Easter season. And we've been directed in the last few weeks to think about the meaning of Jesus through these readings. Jesus didn't arrange these readings for us. The people who built the lectionary and the people who follow the lectionary arrange these particular section of readings, but they point us to these ideas. In the first few weeks after Easter, Jesus has been telling us to go back to my ministry in Galilee, see what I did there, see what I said there, if you want to know who I am. In these readings today and a little bit last week, we have a very strong suggestion of Jesus talking about love and abiding in him in the spirit of love. There is someone who wrote this week asking us to imagine God. If you had two choices, which would you choose to characterize as the major attribute of God? One choice this person gave was the attribute of power, the God of creation, the God who creates everything, the God who parts the Red Sea and does all these other miracles, the God who is the God of the resurrection that great, incredible power. The second choice is the God of love. It's always difficult when people present you uh, choices and dichotomies because life is never so clear cut. It's a little of both all the time, it seems. But think on that. What is the essence here of God in your mind? We often think when we just see the three words, God, we think of the God of power. When we think of Jesus, we think of the God of love. And yet, which would we choose? Do we have to choose? What is the essence of divinity? Is it creation? Is it love? Or perhaps are they both the same? Is creation, is the power of God, the power of creation, the power of love? The ability to bring something forth. The ability to turn a brown field green. The ability to if you're a lamb, if you're a sheep, I suppose, have a lamb gambling in the field this time of year. It's a good thought experiment, and I commend it to you to think on those two things this week. I, again, am going to return a little bit to this theme of the shepherd and the sheep, always popular in church because people talk about flocks and shepherds, ministers the shepherd, congregations the flock, and sometimes a little bit... Um, well, not the most flattering thing in the world, is it, to be thought of as a flock, as a bunch of sheep. To start my research, I went to that font of knowledge, Google, and Googled sheep, and they always give you a few suggested questions you might want to follow. I guess that's, that's, that's their way of getting you in a certain pen, I suppose. But at any rate, here are the questions I saw. Are sheep the dumbest animals? Can sheep be dangerous? Are sheep difficult to keep? Can sheep arise on their own? Why do sheep die so easily? What are sheep scared of? Now, I hope as I've been reading those things, you haven't been putting the congregation or you yourself as part of the flock into any of those uh, categories. 
Why are sheep the dumbest animals? Can sheep be dangerous? Are sheep difficult to keep? Can they arise on their own? Why do they die so easily? And what are sheep afraid of? Oh, we like sheep, right? As in the words of Handel. Well, as someone with some familiarity through the year with congregations, with flocks, I can tell you that by my understanding, if congregations are a flock of sheep, they're not the dumbest animals. They sometimes can be dangerous. They are often difficult to keep. They can arise on their own. Some of them have, arised and have arisen in the middle of a sermon and left. Uh, and some of them arise at the end of a year and leave. And they do die easily. And what are sheep scared of? They're scared of a multitude of things. Some things you would never ever imagine. So I suppose in one way this analogy is, is okay. We tend to see it in those lines of the all loving, all really all powerful, all caring Jesus in these innocent sheep. But sheep are more than that. Sheep actually, if you read through these questions, they're not the dumbest of animals. They are, like congregations, pretty smart. And one of the things that sheep do that's smart, or at least halfway smart, is they stay in a bunch. Uh, they stay in a bunch simply because it's more safe for them to be in a group than to be out alone. Because as even we find in this reading this morning, Jesus says that there are wolves looking out for sheep and they'll eat you up if you don't watch out. And so they stay in a group simply because they can better protect themselves. But to keep themselves in a group, they follow the leader. And that has some problems. Sheep stay in flocks and there is this flock mentality that keep people together and keep people in a group. Now, I read in this research that there was a situation once. This happened, I think, in Australia or New Zealand, where there are, I'm told, even more sheep than you'll find in Vermont. When one sheep moves, it said, the rest will follow, even if it does not seem to be a good idea. Truer words were never spoken. When one sheep moves, the rest will follow. For the most part, when you're in a group and you're safe, you follow the leader and it seems a pretty good idea. You're alive today, you've done what you're supposed to be doing, you're good. But when sheep move, the rest of the flock will follow even if it does not seem to be a good idea. They follow the leader no matter what. In this particular case, the leader thought, I'm assuming I'm going to I should use gender neutral on this, so I'll just say the leader um, decided to start down a 50-foot ravine to the leader's death. And in fact, in this recorded case in Turkey, well, actually not New Zealand, it was Turkey. In this recorded case in Turkey, 400 sheep followed, kind of like the story of the lemmings into the sea. This is where when we hear about sheep, we kind of get a bad impression, right? Because they're instinctive followers. Even no less a person than George Washington used this analogy, borrowed a little bit from the Bible. Washington in Mar on March 15th in 1783 was addressing his soldiers. It's called the Newburgh Address. The reason Washington was addressing his soldiers was his soldiers, not acting like sheep at all, had gotten together a petition. And they were actually suggesting a bit of a mutiny. Uh, they were not getting paid by the Continental Congress. They didn't have enough rations, and the pay that they were promised was not forthcoming. So they circulated a petition. Washington had to quell this minor insurrection. And here's one of the things he said, and this is in the language of the time, speaking to his male soldiers, for if men are to be, and this is why he was both telling them to 
cool their heels, to calm down, he would take care of it, but also the, trying to tell the soldiers, I hear you, and you have a right to bring this petition, and I hear you. So he writes, for if men are to be precluded from offering their sentiments on a matter which may involve the most serious and alarming consequences that can invite the consideration of mankind, reason is of no use to us. If men are precluded from offering their sentiments, reason is of no use to us. The freedom of speech be taken away and dumb and silent, we may be led like sheep to the slaughter. Interesting that Washington reached for the analogy of sheep there who follow blindly versus those soldiers who were petitioning for their rights, standing up for something they thought they deserved. And Washington makes the distinction there in endorsing free speech and freedom of thought and some degree of diversity of thought by saying, you know, this is good if we're to be a reasonable person reasonable people, we need to hear all sides. I need to hear from you. I, your leader, need to hear, Washington says to, the, to his men. But his alternative there is, if we are just a herd and do whatever everyone else says, we're no better than sheep being led to the slaughter, which of course, because of that ability of sheep to follow the leader, it does indeed make sheep easy to lead to a slaughter. The use of the figure, especially in the Gospel of John, of Jesus as the Good Shepherd, shows a connection between people and a connection of following, not so much of being a sheep, but the how we should follow Jesus, in that there are some people you can trust when we're talking about Christ. And you can place that trust in Christ. And you can be safe through the valley of the shadow of death. You can be safe by trusting. And so here the point is how much we trust this one good shepherd not to be led astray. This isn't the one who makes a bad choice. This is the one good choice that can be made. And this is the point that Jesus is making to the people. The sense of love that the shepherd has for the sheep and the sense of the trust and love that the sheep in turn have for the shepherd is what binds them and makes this perfect. It doesn't always end easily. I don't suppose there's ever been a shepherd that hasn't lost a sheep or two. There's often problems but the shepherd will risk everything, unlike the person who, for whom this is just a job. And so, once again in this gospel, we're pointed towards the ultimacy of love. Sometimes when we love, we love because it's joyful and right. Sometimes love is work, sometimes I, hear that from time, if you love me, you would do this. If you love me, you would do this. Jesus isn't really talking about that kind of love. Jesus is talking about the kind of love that never has to say that. Jesus is talking about a kind of love that simply makes us want to do it. It's very hard to get ourselves into that place. We've all experienced both kinds of that loving condition, I suppose. Sometimes we do it out of joy, sometimes we do it out of duty, obligation, we know it must be done, it's hard. And it's not always because we don't have joy in doing it, but sometimes even the love which has given us great joy asks us to do hard things. Very difficult proposition, but I think a key to success in understanding what's important in life and how to pursue it. I'm going to end today on probably not a, probably more a, less, an illustration, which I think is a hard illustration. I hope you'll forgive me for it. Um, I want to start out by thinking about John Lennon and Paul McCartney, A Day in the Life, 
Um, I heard the news today, oh boy, right? I heard the news today, oh boy, is that line. For some reason, don't ask me why I was reading the news. And actually, when Lennon, who wrote most of the words to this particular song, uh, wrote it, he was uh, reading the Daily Mail, the 4,000 holes in Blackburn, Lancashire were actually potholes that were counted and being filled by the good people of Lancashire. But he read that story in the Daily Mail, and I'm giving you a story, a very hard story, actually two hard stories from the Daily Mail. In the space of this last week, two people have jumped off bridges in London into the Thames River. It's actually the Thames River, but I know for some of my Newport friends would never forgive me if I, <laughs> and you'll see me slide into the pronunciation. If you're in Newport, Rhode Island, it's Thames Street. If you're in London, England, it's the Thames River. I've spent more time in Newport than I have in London, not enough time in either of those two places, but more time in Newport than in London. So occasionally I will break into a Thames when I'm supposed to say Thames, I suppose. But. This is the story of two people who jumped into the river. And it's the story of two attempted rescues. Why am I telling this story? Well, because although I don't know whether they were Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, Christian, agnostic, atheist, I don't know who they were. But people went to their rescue. Others jumped into the Thames River to effect a rescue. Greater love hath no person. The good shepherd looks out for their sheep. The idea of love for our fellow human being, such that it would move us to risk our life, is a tough thing. When I talked earlier about love being, you know, it could be joy, it could be work. The love that motivates you when you see someone jump from a bridge to go to rescue is a different kind of love. I think we understand that. We've been talking about it a little bit today, a, an innate, intense love. It's not without its risks. Not every rescue is a sensible rescue. I know here in Vermont and also in New Hampshire, if you're stuck in a place uh, at a certain point, a rescue crew will not attempt a rescue because it's too dangerous to others. But in this case, two cases, rescues were attempted. I'll just share some difficult details. One was a 13-year-old boy jumped off the Tower Bridge. He was on the way to school during a school day. His school uniform was on. He got off an exit early by the bridge. People don't really know why. They say a note was found at some point. We don't know. 8 a.m. on a Tuesday morning, and he jumped off that bridge. Now, I said something earlier about herds and herd mentality. We rejoice at children going back to school. It's a good thing for them. But if any of you have been in elementary school or high school, you know about the herd mentality. You know it's what it is to be part of the flock, and perhaps sometimes you know what it is to be an outsider. I don't know anything about this boy. I don't know how he felt about returning to school. We're told in the media that we're all going to be happy to return to school, and certainly yes. I don't know what motivated anyone here, but this happened. Was he going to a school to be bullied? to be the outsider, to be the outcast? Who knows? But at any rate, a woman jumped in after him. Now, it was 8 a.m. in the morning. The boy's body was never found. The woman was able to re recover a backpack and no more. One witness it said, who was working on a building site on the South Bank said, we all heard his screaming for help, and then a woman who was just walking past with her boyfriend grabbed a float and jumped into the water. She said, why isn't anyone helping him before jumping in herself? 
And that's the most amazing thing, of course, that there were workmen, there was a boyfriend, but it was this one woman who luckily for herself survived, who jumped in with the words, why isn't anyone helping him? There is that sense of love. There is that sense of connectedness. There is that sense that we are all in relation to one another. Did she do something wise or foolish? I don't know, but she showed love at that moment. And the other story is a different variation on the same theme. Less than a week, within the same week, on a different bridge, this one London Bridge, at midnight, we can imagine this one, a woman fell off the bridge into the Thames. This time, two men jumped in after her. Maybe they had read the earlier story and meditated a little bit. I don't know. Two men jumped in. The woman was rescued, the woman who fell, and one of the men who jumped in was rescued. The other man was not rescued. His body was found the next day. Again, greater love hath someone to go after a life, a stray sheep, to effect a rescue. Different stories, different outcomes, a meditation upon really what binds us together as human beings. When you see an injustice, when you see someone in danger, when you see someone who you don't even know who's in a difficult situation, what a human thing it is to respond in love. Not fear, but love. Now, I'm not recommending this for everybody, and I certainly don't want anyone to leave church today and read about later in the, in the day where you, you get on a roadside to help someone change a tire in a dangerous position and something bad happens. I want you to be careful. Don't be foolish in love. But don't forget what it is when there's a crowd of people and all the flock is going in one direction and the moment calls for love. Don't be afraid to leave the flock and to love someone else. Amen. Our sermon hymn is God Whose Giving Knows No Ending.
welcome again, everyone, to the Old First Church here in Bennington, Vermont. Um, first, I want to preface my remarks for, for greetings, saying that we are live streaming. So anything shared here is, I don't think we have like a million viewers. <laughs> I can share with you that we have, I think we have somewhere between um, uh, at least 35 to 40 people who tune in during the week. And I figure every tune in might have more than one set of eyes watching. So that's a good thing. So as many are at home to whom we greet uh, as are here to whom we also greet. So uh, that's what's going on. And um, I should say that uh, first off, want to uh, welcome Noah and Amber. That's their first time back in church, but they brought two other package, packages with them. And um, the first is familiar to us all. It's Winnie. Hi, Winnie. I think I can say this on live stream, I hope. And then we have Isabel, who is the newest addition to their family. Hi, Isabel. That's so wonderful. And over in Sue Philpott's area, we have her grandkids, welcome to you two this morning. Hello, how are you? I hope I didn't have too many gloomy stories this morning, but I had to share that. I think we have one visitor. Uh, you don't have to disclose a lot, but uh, it's, uh, do, do you want to share a name? Are you, are you local, yes or no? Wow, that's your grandmother, that's her grandmother? Great grandmother, great grandmother? Very good, yeah. Well, I would like to wish your great grandmother a happy 102nd birthday. I don't know if she's, 103. Paul, she's got you beat. <laughs> I don't know who's the oldest in this congregation. We have some old ones, but uh, we don't have any 103-year-olds. That's wonderful. So birthday wishes to her. You can look it up on YouTube after. We'll, uh, you know, we'll wish her a happy birthday, and we say our prayers for her and her continued health and happiness. And she's lucky to have a great-great-granddaughter. I bet she loves that. That's a good thing. Okay. Well, welcome. Um, upcoming meetings, uh, we're not really having meetings this week, so I'm not going to tell you about that. I am going to update you a little bit on our friend Anastasia, who um, is recovering from her surgeries and uh, is probably feeling some degree of pain, but also uh, doing better and better, and probably grateful for the support of everyone who have organized meals and taking care of that part of the thing. So thanks to the deacons and to Sandy, who's uh, worked on that. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, I think her sister is also doing better in a slower uh, pace, but she's also doing better. So those are um, people I am thinking of at this moment. I want to thank Jean Marie Callahan, our organist, thank Nancy Andrews, our church administrator, and also thank John Carson, who gets the live stream up and running. So to all of you, thanks for making this possible. Um, no picnic on the green this week. We'll see what the weather brings. Um, it's planned week to week, so we'll see what happens. Um, and those are the announcements I have. We're trying not to do a lot of announcements that aren't handed in prior to. So that, those are the announcements that I have at this moment. If there is nothing more. Yes, yeah, we have the free Sunday supper coming up and other things. They're found in the uh, order of service, so that'll be, that'll be good. If you're listening, you can participate in our morning offering by sending something to Nancy Andrews at the, don't, don't address it to her, don't write the check personally to Nancy. <laughs> Um, unless you, I mean, we're, we don't, we're not sheep here. We can do whatever we want, I suppose. But um, 
uh, you can send your contribution for the morning offering to Nancy Andrews at our address at the Old First Church, One Monument Circle, Old Bennington, Vermont, 05201. That's for the benefit of the wider world. Um, and we hope you will join the people here in supporting our church. Offertory baskets are in the um, stair hall, and if you don't have an opportunity to put something in now, you can contribute on your way out. So I will now ask for the morning offering for the work of our church.
We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, be with us this day. Through the gray and rain, the sun will come, the fields will green, life will spring anew. So may our souls receive the news of your love. May we be refreshed. May we rise and see and love in the light that we are given. This day, O oh God, we remember those who are ill, who struggle with their health, those who are recovering, those who are bearing through difficult times, those who face a valley, a ravine. Be with all who travel dangerous roads, be by their side, give them hope and courage and strength, and give them healing for these days. Dear God, we give you thanks for our families, for the voices of children, for the work of parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. We give you thanks for homes that model peace, justice, and love. And we think of those places where such things are not so evident. We think of places where injustice is done. We ask you to direct our hearts and our actions to those places where love and understanding and kindness is needed. Be with us through times of change. Be with us as a solid foundation upon which we can place our love and risk our lives. We give you thanks, dear God, for those who celebrate many years for those who in their lives have imparted great lessons to others. We give you thanks for those who serve at work in hospitals, doctors, firefighters, emergency personnel who have walked this time with us. We give you thanks for the wonders of science And we give our hope for bright days of spring and summer yet to come. Now in silence, we make our prayer to you. Amen. And as Jesus taught us, we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our final hymn, I note from the, we didn't do this on purpose, and I know France isn't Belgium, but I wish it were, I wish we were singing this in French, not only for your sake, but for my daughter's sake this morning. But um, it was a hymn uh, published under the leadership of John Calvin, and it is uh, from the French Psalter of 1545, the tune, I greet thee who my sure redeemer art. And now may God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine upon us and give us peace this day and evermore. Amen. <laughs>